Um, this is collaboration with my colleagues at uh, Coho. So I'm going to start with an image that I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. Uh, this is our memory hierarchy. This design has been around for decades, and it's been universal because when it's done right, it gives us very high performance at very low costs. So these, this type of design has been around for, for decades, and it's not likely to go anywhere soon. In fact, if anything, what we're seeing right now is that these hierarchies are growing deeper and more diverse, especially at the storage layer. So we've seen recently the ad advent of new storage technologies like PCIe Flash, PCM, shingle disks, um, and we're stacking these all together in these hierarchies. Conceptually, this is a very elegant design, but it turns out it can be challenging to get right. So simply provisioning one of these systems is actually challenging. We have to choose from a vast array of technologies with wildly different performance, capacity, and cost characteristics. And we've discovered this firsthand. So we build a storage system where we can scale flash and disk independently. When we ask storage administrators how much flash do they want for their workloads, they have no idea. So provisioning is a difficult problem, but managing these systems in a running way, in a running system is even more difficult. So this, the storage system must make online decisions about where to place data across these hierarchies. And it has to deal with a wide variety of workloads with very different needs. It has to deal with adversarial workloads, with competing workloads, with workloads that change over time. If the storage system makes poor decisions when placing data, the performance of the entire system can suffer dramatically. So these are very challenging problems faced by a critical system component. Um, but if we can better understand the workloads that we want to serve, we can do a better job of serving them. It turns out, however, that understanding storage workloads is quite difficult. It's easy to accumulate gigabytes of data a day collecting workload traces for even a moderate storage workload. Um, so storing and processing these traces by itself is a challenge. But distilling them down to something that we can use to make online decisions about data placement is much more difficult. So to make this practical, we have to identify what workload characteristics we're most interested in, what characteristics will less, let us solve these problems the best way. In an ideal world, if we knew the future, if we knew what data a workload wanted before it asked for it, we could make the optimal decision at every point. And in fact, the optimal cache, re cache replacement policy was first described in 1966. It's a very simple idea. The idea is basically to prioritize pages with the shortest forward distance. So that is, pages that will be needed soonest in the future get put in fast memory. Of course, we don't know the future, so as systems engineers, what do we do? Well, we assume that the future is going to mirror the past, of course. Um, so this is a very common technique in storage systems, is to use some cache replacement policy like LRU, which is least recently used, or some derivative of it. And the idea here, essentially, is that we'll keep pages with the shortest reuse distance. That, that is, pages that have been used most recently in the past in fast memory, hoping that we'll need to use them again. This doesn't always work, and there are a couple of well-known workloads that perform quite poorly under this uh, replacement policy. But it's dead simple to implement, and it's relatively robust across a number of workloads, so it's quite common in today's systems. Okay, so I said that LRU prioritizes pages based on reuse distance. Well, what do I mean by that exactly? Simply put, the reuse distance is the number of distinct disk requests we've seen since a request for a block and a re-request for that block. And we can think of reuse distances as a measure of locality. So workloads that exhibit a large number of very low reuse distances feature a very strong temporal locality, and those will do well with small amounts of fast memory. We can also use reuse distances to model workload behavior. So we can use reuse distances to help us understand how a workload would behave in a differently configured memory hierarchy. And we can also use these models to help us design better hier hierarchies and manage them better. So it's common to, to plot these reuse distances as a misratio curve. And speaking generically, a misratio curve is just a plot of misrate versus cache size for a specific workload under a specific replacement policy. We can construct a misratio curve for any arbitrary replacement policy. But when we compute the MRC for an LRU policy, what we're actually doing is computing the distri distribution of reuse distances. 
And you can see this by realizing that in an LRU list, the location of a page, the distance from the most recently used element in that list is exactly its reuse distance. All right, so here's an example of a real life MRC. Uh, this is computed from a trace collected by MSR Cambridge. It follows a, a collection of enterprise servers for a week, and this particular server is a web SQL server. So the way to interpret this chart essentially is to pick a point on the line, follow it over to the y-axis, and this gives you your miss rate at the cache size that you see at the corresponding x-axis. From these charts, you can also infer the relative cost of caching this workload, right? So when you see a long vertical bar here, what that tells you is that increasing your cache size just minimally to include that region will reduce your miss rate quite significantly. So that adding a little bit of cache will give you a big bang for your buck. Conversely, when you see a long horizontal line, that tells you that you can add, in this case, up to 20 gigs of cache and have very little effect on the miss rate. So that would be expensive to do. So as you might expect, miss ratio curves change dramatically according to the workloads we're looking at. So these workloads are again taken from MSR Cambridge. We have a couple of different machines, a hardware monitor, a web proxy, and again, the SQL server. And you can see that the shape of the curves and the sizes and hit rates are all quite distinct. These MRCs also change quite dramatically over time within a given workload. So this is again is the SQL server, but I'm showing you now just the first hour, the first 12 hours, and then the entire week. And we can see that over time the curve changes quite dramatically. So the fact that these curves are tied very closely to specific workloads and they change over time tells us that if we want to use these curves to make online decisions, we have to be able to compute the curves themselves online. So how do we compute MRCs? Well, the naive approach is basically to just simulate a workload using LRU, once at each cache size that you're interested in, compute the miss rate at that point, and put it in a plot, and you're done. Uh, but this is a lot of simulations, and it's not going to be feasible for online computation. However, in the 70s, Matson and his colleagues made the observation that some replacement policies are inclusive. And what he means by inclusive is that for a given workload at a given time, a cache, any larger cache will include an exact copy of a smaller cache. So larger caches include the exact contents of smaller caches for these policies. And it turns out that there are a couple of interesting policies that exhibit this property, including LRU, LFU, and the optimal policy that I mentioned earlier. When we're working with these policies, it's possible to simulate all cache sizes in a single pass because we know whenever we see a hit at size n, any cache larger than n will also give us a hit. So the algorithm for computing the MRC for LRU in a single pass goes as follows. For every request in your workload, you compute the reuse distance. You aggregate these distances into a histogram, and then you compute the cum cumulative sum, and that gives you your MRC. So let's look at the complexity of this algorithm. Uh, the time complexity, if we're given a workload with n requests touching m distinct addresses, the time complexity is O n of m. Um, that was the original algorithm given by Matson, and it's linear in n because he was using a linked list to search for pages. Uh, but this was reduced to n log m uh, later on by using balanced search trees. The memory overhead, however, started out O m, and it hasn't really changed since. And it turns out this memory overhead makes this technique quite impractical. So we've been studying the MSR Cambridge workloads, and we implemented Matson because we wanted to do some analyses on their miss rate curves. And we found that for that combined MSR workload, which touches about 2.7 terabytes of unique data, we needed 92 gigs of RAM to compute the MRC. So if we're performing these kind of computations to manage our memory hierarchies, we're being counterproductive. We need a more efficient way to do this. So let's go back and look at the algorithm. What's the most expensive step here? It's computing reuse distances. So we ask, can we do this more efficiently? And the answer is yes. So we've developed a technique that lets us compute reuse distances or approximate reuse distances, and by extension, approximate MRCs in sublinear memory. So going back to the MSR Cambridge workloads, we can compute that MRC in just 80 megs, where before we were using 92 gigs of RAM. OK, so how do we do that? Well, we use a new data structure we've developed called the counter stack. And the big idea behind counter stacks is that they measure uniqueness over time. So we observe that computing reuse distances is very closely related to counting distinct elements. 
So I want you to think of, as a thought experiment, imagine a stack of cardinality counters where we have one counter for every request in a storage workload. I'm going to work through an example here. The reference string you can think of as requests to disk addresses. So we have a request for disk address A here. We start a cardinality counter. It's seen exactly one unique disk address, A. We get a new request for B. We increment our first counter because it's now seen two distinct disk addresses, A and B, and we also start another counter. We get a request for C. Again, this is unique for both of the counters that we started so far, so their cardinalities increase, and we create yet another counter. Now we get a request for A. So the, counter, the first counter that we started has already seen A before, so this is not a distinct address for that counter, so its cardinality does not increase. However, the next two counters have not seen A, so their cardinalities do increase. Finally, we create one more counter for this new request. So the first thing to observe from this example is that when we see a difference in the change between adjacent counters, we know that we've seen a repeated reference in our workload, in our reference string. So here when we see our first counter does not increase when it goes from three to three, and our second counter does increase by going from two to three, that implies that we've had a repeated reference in the workload. The second thing that you should observe here is that the cardinality at the counter who did not increase is actually the reuse distance. So here, the value of our cardinality counter, T0, which is three, is exactly the reuse distance for the second reference to the disk address A. So putting this all together, the way we compute misratio curves with this technique is we compute this matrix C over the entire workload. At every epoch in time, we transform C into another matrix which we call delta X. Delta X is just the change in each individual counter at each time. So the first row we can see that the counter has started at T0 changed by one by one by one and by zero. From the matrix delta X, we then compute the matrix delta Y, which is just the difference in the differences in delta X. So this is the difference in the changes in adjacent counters. And this matrix will be all zeros except when we see non-zeros, in this case a one. This one tells us that there was a reuse or a re-reference at this time, right? So we find the index of this non-zero element, we map that back into the original matrix C, and we observe the cardinality of the counter there which is three, and that gives us our reuse distance. All right, so the algorithm that I just described maintains one cardinality counter per request in your workload. Um, this is actually quadratic overhead. This is super expensive. So if we Im implement this algorithm exactly as I described it, uh, we're going in the wrong direction. We did a rough calculation, and we computed it would take something like five zettabytes of RAM to use this method to compute the MRC of the MSR traces, okay? Fortunately, this matrix C is highly redundant. As you can see, even from this small example, there's a lot of redundant information here. So this matrix is uh, amenable to a number of lossy compression techniques. And it turns out with storage workloads that have very large reuse distances, introducing a small bit of inaccuracy is not problematic. So we have a couple of different compression techniques that we use to make this manageable. The first is very simple. We call it downsampling. And the basic idea here is instead of keeping a counter for every request, we just keep a counter for every kth request. And instead of observing their values at every request, we observe their values at every kth request. So this immediately reduces the memory overhead quite a bit, and it introduces some uncertainty into RMRC. This uncertainty is proportional to the parameter k that we choose. The second compression technique we use is we call it pruning, and the idea here essentially is that over time, counters may observe the same set of symbols. When they do, their cardinality values will be identical to each other. They'll converge to the same value and they'll never diverge again. So at this point, there's no need to maintain the duplicate counter. So in this, this example, we can see we have two counters here that both have value three, which is the same as a counter at T0. So we don't need to keep those. We can get rid of them and again, reclaim some space. This introduces some uncertainty, which is proportional to the pruning distance P, which again is tunable. But the big savings that we get here is by using approximate counting. So even the matrix that I showed you before, if we're using perfect counting, each counter in that matrix would have memory overheads relative to the number of unique elements in our workload, making this still not feasible. However, 
we're making use of some probabilistic counters. So this is a technique that's come out of the streaming algorithms community. Uh, Hyperloglog -log in particular is what we're using. It, this was developed in 2007. And it gives quite accurate estimates of very large multisets with sublinear memory overheads. This again introduces some error, which is proportional to the error of the counters themselves. But putting these three compression techniques together, we have now an algorithm for computing misratio curves with sublinear memory overhead. So this makes this algorithm practical to use online. We can compute MRCs in running production systems. But this data structure actually allows us to do more. So it turns out that we can compute delta x, delta y, and reuse distances for a workload just using the last two columns of C. We don't even need to maintain the full matrix. However, we still do. We save that matrix to disk. We call it a counter stack stream. And this is kind of a history of locality. You can think of it as a sort of database of workload behavior. And we can query this database in some kind of interesting ways. So this is a diagram of the system that we've built. We have a library for reading counter stacks. And we have a couple of specification operations that allow us to look at very specific regions of a workload. So we can look at just a small point in time of a workload. We can combine various workloads together to model how they would behave if they were running in the same cache. And for any workload specification, we can tell you the number of unique requests and compute the misratio curve, among other things. So this API actually lets us do some kind of interesting analyses. Um, for example, we can search for outliers in a workload. We can look for periods where a workload is touching a large number, an abnormally large number of unique blocks. We can also look for phase changes to try to identify when workload behavior is changing. And we can even do things like explore coarse grain scheduling. So for example, if you have a nightly backup job that runs at 2 in the morning and you find that that's trash in your cache, you could experiment shifting that forward and backward in time to see how it would affect your overall hit rate. So it's worth noting that these types of queries, once we've converted a workload into CounterStack, we can execute these queries in just a matter of seconds. So it's super efficient to perform these kinds of analyses. All right, so the question now we have to ask is, how much do these things cost? And I've kind of already given the punchline away. Um, we've reduced memory overhead significantly. So we can compute MRCs in uh, 80 megs of RAM for this MSR Cambridge workload that touches three terabytes of data, where before we were needing 92 gigs of RAM. And it turns out the on-disk representation is quite sparse as well. So the original MSR workload comes in about five gigs of GS GZIP CSV files. And we can compress that down to something like three gigs if we convert it to a simple binary format. But this is still quite large for a week worth of history. However, our counter stack stream, we can save in anywhere from 1 to 11 megs of disk space. So at these costs, it's reasonable to imagine performing these computations in an online system. And it's reasonable to imagine saving months or even years worth of storage history. All right, so the final question we have to address is uh, how well do these things work? How accurate are they? I said we introduced some error. Let's look at that. I'll say that there's more details in the paper, but for now, we'll just look at a few representative plots. So this, again, is the HMMRC that I showed you earlier. This was computed with the Matson algorithm, so you can think of this as the ground truth. And now I'm showing you our high fidelity counter stack curve, and you can see it's tracking Matson quite closely. And this is the low fidelity curve. You can see it introduces a little bit of error here, but it gets the general trend quite accurately. Here again is the proxy server I showed you before. This is Matson, the ground truth. Um, our high fidelity representation, again, tracking quite closely. And our low fidelity one, here you can't even tell the difference between low and high fidelity. And finally, the web server that, would have, that I've been using as a running example, here's Matson. Our high fidelity, again, tracks it quite closely. And here, with our low fidelity, you can start to see uh, a little bit more error. So one interesting thing about this technique is that accuracy is actually related to the shape of the curves that we're computing. In particular, curves with very jagged edges, like this one, will introduce a little bit more error, especially at low fidelity. All right, so in conclusion, we've developed a new data structure, which we call the counter stack. This measures uniqueness over a time. It has very low memory and storage overheads. And it makes it easy to capture, process, and store workload histories. And we've been using it in production at Coho to collect traces from the field, to help make online placement decisions, and to forecast the benefits of adding more hardware. All right, thank you.
Any questions? Hi, uh, yeah, uh, Michael Condit, NetApp. Uh, uh, thanks, that was a very good explanation. Um, I understood that more quickly than at the poster <laughs> session last night. Um, <laughs> the, uh, well, I hadn't had any wine this morning. Yeah, that helps, uh, right? <laughs> The, my question is, you said that it's sublinear in its use of memory, but your algorithm for updating a counter requires knowing uh, that, that you have a repeated reference. Um, so how do you avoid keeping track of every symbol, every unique symbol that you've seen? Actually, the, so the algorithm that I described, when, when we've computed delta y, it's just simply looking for non-zero elements in delta y. That tells us when the repeated references happened. But I'm talking about the computation of the original matrix that delta y is indirectly based on. So the original matrix is just an array of counters. And at every epoch, we update those counters. Right, but how do you know whether you should increment the counter or that, not? That's what the hyperlog log does. So hyperlog log is a cardinality estimator. So you just give it a set of symbols, and it tells you how many unique symbols it thinks it's seen. OK, thank you. Hi, Scott Kaplan, Amherst College. Um, okay. One thing I'm, I take it you obviously, you didn't actually go ahead and attempt to run this online in a kernel yet, that that's, you've shown it to be efficient, but you actually haven't put it into a system yet? Oh yeah, we have it in, uh, it's coming out in our next release actually, so it's, so we're running it right now. Yeah. How does it compare, this has been, gathering these miscurves has been done before online, um, and in particular, 2004 paper and ASPLOS by YYJ and her group mm -hmm. did this for relatively low overhead. I'm aware of another project that got it down to two or three percent to gather the curve. So, how do you expect yours to compare to something like that? Um, if I, I think I know the paper you're referring to, and I don't believe they're maintaining like full workload histories up to like three terabytes, where we're going back months in, in the past. I think what they were doing is just computing MRCs over very short intervals in time, which dramatically reduces the number of unique elements that you see. Unfortunately, at the storage layer, that is less effective for us because we have workloads that have like periodic events, you know, on the scale of weeks or months. So we need to actually include much more history. Okay. Um, so I, I don't think those techniques are quite applicable for us. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Tim Wood from George Washington University. Uh, you mentioned that the error that you have is based is affected by the shape of the curve. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, can you, can you use that to kind of feed back into your system and uh, detect the workload or yes. use that somehow? I mean, that, that's a very good question. So like, if we can do some sort of simple elbow detection in these curves, right? And if we notice that we have curves like this that are very jagged, we can dynamically increase the fidelity of the counters to sort of right. introduce I mean, it's, less error. It's those elbows that you probably care the most about. Exactly. That's where you get your bang. Yeah, yeah, very good question.